Okay, Revelation chapter uh, 13. We're just finishing up the last few verses there on the mark of the beast. This is lecture number 15. Uh, we open up Revelation 13. We discussed it a little bit in the last lecture. I'll just read those last three verses again. Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. And he causes all, that's the ant, the uh, false prophet, he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell, except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. And so this mark on the right hand or the forehead in the last days, uh, you must have it in order to buy it or sell, so it will be a, a cashless society. Uh, the 666, we talked about that a little bit, how the universal product code is right now on a 666 code. Uh, the uh, microchip technology, uh, I forgot to bring that book with the, the Lalonde Brothers, The Mark of the Beast, uh, but the microchip technology uh, seems to be going and heading in this direction where they just put a little tiny microchip in uh, somebody's right hand or their forehead and uh, it would be able to be decoded at a, uh, a supermarket line, just like right now the groceries are with the universal product code. Uh, but if you don't have this, then you cannot buy or sell. And if you can't buy or sell, it's going to be pretty hard to uh, eat, obviously. You're going to have to fend for yourself. And you'll be, uh, Christians will be hunted. You'll be condemned to death. Uh, and so... Pretty much, that'll be the the main power of the Antichrist, the fact that he's going to control the entire monetary system, the entire uh, economy of the world through this mark. And, uh, and so Christians are going to have to, those who trust in Christ, refuse to bow down before the Antichrist, are going to have to uh, be in hiding, and fend for themselves and maybe hunt for their own food and in the meantime they're going to be uh, uh, trying to escape the Antichrist and his uh, thugs as uh, they try to hunt down Christians. Now Revelation 14 uh, the first 13 verses talk about God being victorious uh, the 144,000 are mentioned in verses 1 to 5. Verses 6 and 7 is the eternal gospel. Uh, the proclamation of the fall of Babylon in verse 8. There's a warning about those who receive the mark of the beast in verses 9 to 12. There's blessing for martyrs in verse 13. And verses 14 to 20 speak of the return of Christ. So let's take a look at that. Revelation chapter 14, first we'll take a look at the 144,000 in verses 1 to 5. And I looked and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their hearts. And they sang a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who had not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth, they are blameless. And so the 144,000, their identity, uh, they're apparently the same 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, the 
12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, they may be the first of the remnant of Israel to be saved. Where all Israel is saved in the last days according to Romans 11 verses 25 to 27. These are the 144 that are that are saved, uh, the first of the remnant uh, of Israel to be saved. Uh, some would place these before the tribulation, others would place them after the tribulation. We're not really sure. We're not really giving it up information. It says they are with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is uh, in Jerusalem, and, and there's four mounts there, and uh, Mount Zion is often, Jerusalem is often referred to as Mount Zion when it's reference to the more of the heavenly Jerusalem so it's, it's, it's tough to, to state exactly what's going on here uh, but Christ has already returned and the millennium has begun so it would appear to be a scene on earth uh, with Jerusalem referred to as Mount Zion uh, so that would imply that it's, it's God's city uh, these 144,000, they are saved because the name of the Father and the Son is on their foreheads. Uh, this speaks of God's protection of them and God's ownership over them. Uh, voice from heaven, it says, They sang as one, the multitudes of heaven had, had the sound of many waters and the sound of loud thunder, so it's majestic and powerful. The sound of harpists, there's beautiful uh, singing, beautiful music. Uh, and the multitude in heaven sings a new song uh, before God's throne. Again, you have the four creatures, or probably angelic beings, and the 24 elders. Uh, but only the 144,000 can learn this song. So this speaks of their, their closeness. Uh, to Christ. The description of the 144,000 that purchased from the earth, they're referred to as being celibate. Now the question comes up, is this, uh, is this talking about being spiritually uh, faithful to Christ or is it talking about them uh, being uh, physically uh, celibate? Uh, and so uh, the description of the 144,000 here of them being celibate, the question of is it spiritual or is it physical? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 32 to 35, the Apostle Paul speaks a little bit about Christians and marriage. In 1 Corinthians 7, Verses 32, uh, Paul says, uh, But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. His interests are divided. And the woman who is unmarried and a virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is seemly, and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Uh, now it also says that the one that marries doesn't sin, and that if you burn with desire, you should marry. Uh, but the point here is Paul is saying that there are some benefits to remaining single. You can devote your life to the Lord. Uh, once you get married, you still have to devote your life to the Lord, but your number one ministry becomes uh, keeping that marriage intact and taking care of your mate. Uh, so these celibate 144,000 could very well be physically celibate. Now there's kibbutzes in, in Israel and uh, where young Jewish people remain unmarried and uh, it could very well be that these 144,000 are physically celibate but uh, then again it may not be the case it might be just symbolically speaking it, it, as far as uh, uh, they just may be spiritually faithful to the Lord uh, but it mentions that they follow uh, 
the Lamb. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And uh, so they follow Christ without compromise, which is what Jesus told us we should do in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 36. Uh, we should uh, deny ourselves, uh, pick up the, the cross and follow Christ as He walks the path of obedience to the Father. Uh, they're referred to as the first fruits, uh, which means that it's the beginning of a great harvest. Uh, the first fruits is the guarantee that there is more to follow, and so this might be the beginning of a great harvest of Jews, and so this is one of the reasons why I believe that they're the first of the remnant of Israel, the remaining ones of Israel that are going to uh, accept Christ when he returns. It says that no lie is found in them, so apparently that's because they rejected all false religion. They're referred to as blameless because they're obedient to Christ. So these 144,000. Now, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, it speaks of the eternal gospel. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So the eternal gospel. Now, Matthew 24, verse 14 says that the gospel will be preached to all nations, and then the end shall come. And... Uh, so this might be a kind of an announcement that the, uh, the gospel is going to be preached to all nations. Uh, gospel literally means uh, good news. Uh, the content of the message here is that God is to be feared, fear God, and give God the glory. Put the spotlight on Him. Honor Him. Uh, his judgment has come. So it's like it's as if this message is proclaimed as the last chance to turn back to God before the judgment falls. And then it says, worship God. Uh, in other words, recognize God as the ultimately worthy being, uh, for God has created uh, all things. Uh, verse 8 proclaims the fall of Babylon. Look at verse 8. And another angel, a second one, follows saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Uh, Babylon is a symbolic title for the revived Roman Empire. Uh, and it's actually a symbolic title for the satanic world system. Uh, the uh, system of uh, organized false religion uh, dating back to the ancient Babylonian Empire with uh, Nimrod and the uh, Tower of Babel. Uh, Babylon was the first united system against God after Noah's flood. Uh, this false religious system and uh, it st states here that all the nations were forced to drink of the wine of the passion of immorality uh, and the immorality here is talking about false religion. It's in the sense not physical immorality, but spiritual immorality, spiritual adultery, false religion. And it's symbolic for the perversion of true worship. And so this Babylon here is speaking of this, the end time revived Roman Empire, which will have an end time uh, world church, an apostate church, that will force all mankind uh, to in, in, engage in their false worship or uh, face the death sentence and not be able to buy or sell, as the mark of the beast said in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. Now, Babylon the Great is going to fall. It's going to cave in. That's what's been announced here in verse 8. And because of it, uh, by the way, for a little background on the uh, Tower of Babel and the, the start of Babylon as the uh, kind of the uh, capital of uh, false religion and organized religion and state-sponsored 
false religion, that's in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, whereas the, the fall of Babylon in detail is given in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Now the warning about the mark, we already discussed this earlier, when we were on Revelation 13, but look at Revelation 14 now, verses 9 to 12, warning about the mark of the beast. And another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So the warning about the mark here, yeah. The question the, uh, the God not forgiving these people uh, is, uh, I wonder if it's so much that they take the mark or is just a final, is the mark is the final part of their hearts and from the completely hard. Which you see that? Yeah, I, I see it as the second one that the, the basically, uh, in order to accept the mark, since the gospel will have been preached to all nations, and since God is going to send a lie because people have already rejected the truth, Second Thessalonians 2, it seems to me that these people will either have already blasphemed the Holy Spirit or will blaspheme the Holy Spirit by accepting the mark. But basically, there it's a final heart denial of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I think that's the choice that people are going to be given to is... Uh, you can worship the Antichrist and accept his mark and then have the, and we'll throw in the benefit that you can buy itself. Uh, but uh, if you reject the mark, it's the same with the, with the uh, early Christians. Uh, they could care less what gods you were worshiping. The uh, Roman Empire, so long as you said Caesar is Lord and then and, uh, we'll also worship Caesar as one of your gods. But if you said, no, I, I, Jesus is Lord, period, and I will not say Caesar is Lord, Jesus alone is God, then the Roman Empire couldn't tolerate that. So it's that sole allegiance to Jesus Christ, the Savior, that the, uh, that the end time world government is not going to be able to tolerate. So then they can't, they can't get a group of people to come sit on the market and then you can get them to go. What's that? They, they won't force them physically restrain somebody in the market and they won't be damned. No, it seems that the, uh, it seems that especially with the beheading and those who don't accept the mark, will, it seems that they're not going to hold you down to get the mark. It seems that they want it to be a voluntary thing. And, and it, it seems to be the direction that the, the governments and the world is heading that, you know, freedom's a big thing and that's, uh, freedom is great, but freedom was never meant to be the number one issue. And uh, and so they would probably make that elevated to where uh, you've got the freedom to say no, but then they're going to have their consequences coming after you. But they do not want to force uh, the mark on you. I, I think Satan wants to do more than just put a stamp on you. Uh, he wants your soul and your allegiance, and he wants to uh, see to it that you're, you will have no part in God's kingdom. Uh, but those who receive the mark of the beast will suffer God's eternal wrath. Wrath will be tormented with fire and brimstone forever, and will have no rest day and night throughout all eternity. Obviously, a description of the flames of hell. Now, in this passage, if you look real close in verse ten, it's they'll be tormented forever and ever in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Jesus and the good angels have charge of hell, not Satan. All those movies we saw where Satan checks you into hell and he's in charge and pulling shots. If anything, Satan will have the lowest the lowest position in hell. Uh, it's, it, the, the scriptures indicate that uh, in heaven there's rewards, uh, different degrees of rewards, in reference to the different uh, uh, levels of commitment and obedience to the Lord, but it's the same way in hell. There's different degrees of punishment. So Satan will get the maximum punishment, 
not the minimum punishment. He's not going to rule in hell. Uh, also, it states here that uh, this should help the saints endure the tribulation because God will avenge their persecutors and as bad as the tribulation is, it's a heck of a lot better than hell. And therefore, uh, the saints should be able to endure the tribulation knowing that the, to accept the mark is not going to be a way out. It's just, uh, it's just going to bring on the eternal flames of hell. And therefore, they can persevere and trust in God. God will avenge the persecutors and will rescue them. Uh, hell, by the way, is separation from God. And it is our own choice. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verses 6 to 10, uh, speaks about this a little bit. You could look that up uh, on your own. Verse 13, blessing for the martyrs. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. And... Uh, so, uh, apparently at this point in the tribulation that those who are martyred, the dead believer at least is going to find rest. Uh, and this is in direct antithesis to those who accept the mark of the beast. The dead believer finds rest, but uh, a living non-believer who accepts the mark will have no rest day and night forever and ever. Uh, by the way, uh, rest comes only in Christ. Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John 16, verse 33. Jesus says, "In the world you have tribulation, but uh, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world." And uh, uh, so, in Jesus Christ, we find the rest and peace that we need. And verses 14 to 20 talk about the return of Christ. Now, this is mentioned several times throughout Revelation. So again, don't look upon Revelation as one chapter following after the other in sequence. Uh, the second coming of Christ is mentioned over and over again. <coughs> look at verse 14 of Revelation chapter 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So one like a son of man. His identity, he is Jesus. He is, uh, this is the second coming of Christ, the Messiah. Daniel chapter 7. In fact, in fact take a look back at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It's talking about the, uh, the uh, vision of the beast. It's talking about the uh, empires. And uh, it said in verses 13 and 14, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man is coming. Exact same phrase, only in a different language. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So the one like the Son of Man that comes amidst the clouds, comes with the clouds of heaven according to Daniel 7 and Revelation 14 could be none other than Jesus Christ. So it's speaking about the second coming of Christ to her. Uh, sitting on the cloud, on the cloud, uh, Christ's return is in the clouds. Revelation 1 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31 speak of Christ's return amidst the clouds. Uh, now, uh, the cloud, some speculate it might be the Shekinah glory cloud of Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, where a, a, a pillar of fire would lead the Israelites through the wilderness at night, but a cloud would lead them through the 
uh, wilderness during the day and it was called the Shekinah glory cloud and uh, that is a possibility uh, the golden crown upon Christ that Christ is returning as king the sharp sickle means that it is time it is a time of harvest and a time of judgment it is time to separate uh, to destroy that which is uh, uh, to destroy that which needs to be destroyed and to gather up uh, uh, the crop that needs to be gathered. Uh, verses 15 and 16, we have an angel's announcement here in Revelation chapter 14. And another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sip, sickle and reap, because the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he sat on the clouds, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. So an angel's announcement, the angel comes out of the temple, tells Christ the earth is ripe for judgment, the time of God's wrath has come, and Christ swings his sickle over the earth, uh, representing God's wrath uh, coming to earth. So God's wrath is then mentioned in verses 17 to 20 of Revelation chapter 14. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out of the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because their grapes are ripe. And the angel swung his sickle to the earth, and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Uh, so another angel comes up out of the temple with a sharp sickle. Still even another angel tells him to, to uh, gather the non-believers. This is the angel that has the power over fire. And this angel comes out from the altar. Now, again, the symbolism here, it's very difficult to know how literal this is, uh, but it seems to be pretty straightforward at this particular point. For Christ has returned, it is time for the non-believers to be judged, and God's wrath here is viewed as grapes being crushed to make wine. And so keep that in mind, you got to... You know, we think of grapes being stepped on to, to make wine and stuff, but just think of that type of illustration of grapes being crushed to make wine, because then the next illustration given is that the blood of the non-believing humanity, when Christ judges them, possibly the armies invading Israel, uh, the blood will be up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now, there's several different ways of looking at that uh, and uh, one is that the blood just splashes up to the horse's bridle there's a lot of bloodshed but this blood splashes to the horse's bridle all along you know Christ has his angelic troops all along this 200 mile strip and uh which you know starts in Armageddon, but then runs out throughout the whole land of Palestine. And uh, another is that there would be so much devastation. Now there's millions upon millions of troops there on this big, huge battlefield, uh, and that uh, the devastation could be so bad that that act of blood actually does fill up that high. Now, I don't even know if that's possible. I do know, and this is kind of gross, but I do know that before I was a believer, when I used to watch years ago Saturday Night Live, they at one time took a fish, I think it was Dan Aykroyd, and put it in a blender, a dead fish, and blended it up, and he reduced that fish basically the liquid form and it literally filled that thing to overflowing when there was plenty of room before the, the thing was reduced to just just the blood but what, what I am getting at is that 
if the judgment is real, if the judgment is real, real devastating, there's a lot more. If you reduce us to nothing but blood, it's amazing how how much blood that would actually be. Take a look at Zechariah 14. And this is the reason why I gave that illustration there. Uh, what I'm getting at here is don't underestimate uh, the horrible aspects to God's wrath when Christ returns. It's going to be more horrible than anything we've ever seen before in our lives. Look at Zechariah 14 and verse 12. Uh, this is talking about when Christ returns. Uh, in, in verses, the same context of Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that, that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. But that gives you the basic setting, the Millennial Kingdom and all that. So when we go to verse 12, it's right before Christ reigns on earth, and so he's returning to earth at this point. And listen to what it says here. Now, this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will rot in their mouth. Now, that's some pretty devastating stuff there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, I have read of some modern weaponry that uh, that brings about the same type, so it's mainly the radiation that that does it. So uh, even the, even the description of Christ is holding all the elements together of the universe seems that if you know obviously if he wanted any man can do God can do better. And if he wants to split atoms or split nucleuses of atoms. Uh, he'd have no problem doing it. So he's got his own nuclear warhead to make ours look uh, look like toys, but uh, what I'm getting at is the devastation that is going to occur when Christ returns. Uh, we should not over uh, underestimate it, and uh, and th- this idea of Jesus Christ as the the mellow wimp of Galilee is uh, about as far from the Jesus of the Bible as can be. He's a loving Lord. Uh, he, he loves us. He wants to save us. Uh, we're going to see in Revelation 19, 11 to 21. Also talks about the blood and the, the the how gory it is when Christ returns and he uh, uh, literally uh, devastates his enemies. Uh, but we need to keep in mind the two comings of Christ. They do not contradict each other, but there are two separate purposes. The same God, who is the source of all love, is also uh, the the source of all justice. And is the holy God who cannot have sin come before him and must judge and punish all sin. Uh, I'll give you just a few contrasts here. Uh, in contrasting Christ's two comings. In his first coming, he came as a lamb to die, John 129. But in his second coming, he comes as a lion to reign. Uh, Revelation 5.5 5 and Revelation 19.16. His first coming, he came as a helpless child, Luke two seven. But in his second coming, he comes as a fearless warrior, Revelation nineteen eleven. His first coming, he was born in a manger, a very lowly beginning, Luke two seven. His second coming, he returns in power, Revelation twenty four thirty. His first coming, he died in shame, Philippians two eight. His second coming, he returns in glory, Matthew twenty four thirty. His first coming, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, Matthew 21, 6 and 7. His second coming, he rides a white stallion, Revelation 19, 11. His first coming, he came to save, John 3, 17. His second coming, he comes to judge, Revelation 19, 11. His first coming, he came to serve, Mark 10, 45. His second coming, he comes to rule, Revelation 19, 15. 
His first coming, now this is the mellow Jesus that all the Buddhists like and the Hindus like, this mellow, peace-loving Jesus, they think. But Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34 to 36, that his first coming, he did not come to bring peace. He came to divide. So when he came as this quote-unquote mellow guy, uh, born in a major and all, he came not to bring peace, but to separate, to divide people, the believers from the non-believers. But his second coming is when he comes as the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, and he comes to enforce peace through his strength, Revelation 19, 15, the shepherd of the nations with an iron rod. In other words, when Jesus comes to bring peace on earth, he's not going to come like a no-nuker. He's going to come like the, the biggest war hawk uh, the world has ever known. And he's going to enforce peace through his strength. Like that's the only way to get peace in a world of sinful men is uh, to carry a bigger stick than anybody else has got and then to enforce peace uh, through your strength, which is pretty much the Ronald Reagan doctrine, the Archbishop Raymond Hunhausen idea that we need to unilaterally disarm uh, uh, would not have served the purpose of world peace uh, uh, too well at all. Uh, that leads us to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, which gives us an introduction into the seven plagues of God's wrath. I believe the seven plagues of God's wrath, since uh, he got the signs and uh, the sixth seal, uh, the sun being dark and the moon not giving us light, stars fall from the sky, which Jesus identified those signs as occurring immediately after the tribulation of the When that occurs, that's when everybody knows that the wrath of the Lamb is coming. So the seven bowls of God's wrath, uh, I would place after the tribulation period, that's what we're protected from according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe, verse 9. And uh, so I would place these seven bowls of God's wrath, uh, Revelation 15 and 16, immediately after the tribulation period. Uh, Look at verse 1, which introduces this chapter. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So John introduces this chapter. He sees another sign in heaven. It's the third sign. The first sign he saw was the woman... That turned out to be the nation of Israel in Revelation chapter 12. And uh, he also saw the uh, in that uh, vision, that sign in heaven, uh, the, uh, see the third sign, I'm losing track here already. Three's a big number. Uh, we saw the, the dragon, Satan, representative of Satan and his kingdom in Revelation chapter 12. Okay, yeah, then the seven angels, the seven final seven plagues here in Revelation 15. So up to this point, there's the third sign, three different signs that, that John states that he sees. These seven plagues are referred to as the, as the last. Uh, seven is the number of completion. Uh, six, man's number falls short of, of God's number of completion. But it says, in them the wrath of God is complete. Uh, thumos is the word for uh, anger or the word for wrath here. Uh, and it brings up the idea, not an outburst of anger, but an all-consuming, constant uh, attitude of anger. Uh, that is brought against sin. Uh, but the return of Christ immediately follows uh, these bowls, the uh, wrath of God. This sign is described as being great and marvelous, uh, great because the plagues are awesome judgments, the, the word in the Greek is mega, and marvelous because it's that which arouses wonder uh, or astonishment. Uh, verse 2, a sea of glass is referred to. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mixed with fire, 
And those who had come off victorious from the beast, and from his image, and from the number of his name, standing on a sea of glass, holding harps of God. And so a sea of glass, uh, this may speak of the, uh, the glory and the, the holiness of God. Revelation 4, 6. That close to the card is a few glass. And Revelation 4, 6 says, And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, uh, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. So this may speak of the glory and the holiness of God because it's also viewed as surrounding uh, the uh, throne of God. Uh, sea of glass is mixed with fire, which uh, probably symbolizes the divine judgment uh, proceeding from God's holiness. Uh, those standing on the sea of glass. Uh, so they're, they're, they're standing on God's holiness, not their own. They are victorious from the beast. They did not fall to his deception. They did not bow to his image. They remained faithful to Christ. They did not receive his number. They chose Christ over their physical needs. And they're holding hearts of God. They worship God throughout all eternity. And uh, these may be martyr tribulation believers uh, who are now who are in heaven at this point. Uh, when uh, Christ is about to return. Uh, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is mentioned in verses 3 and 4 of this chapter. If you take a look at verses 3 and 4 of Revelation chapter 15. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God, the Almighty Righteous and true are they of thy ways, thou King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy. For all the nations will come and worship before thee, for thy righteous acts have been revealed. And so the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is probably called the song of Moses because it resembles his songs uh, mentioned in Exodus chapter 15 uh, which was honoring God for delivering Israel from Egypt and parting the Red Sea and Deuteronomy chapter 32 which honors God for faith for his faithfulness and for the de- defeating Israel's enemies uh, for them. Uh, that was near Moses' death when he came up with that song. It was also called the song of the Lamb because it glorifies him as the king of the nations. Uh, the psalm states, uh, Great and marvelous are God's works. Uh, they are incomparable, awesome works of God. God is referred to as uh, Matt, uh, the Lord, which means master. Uh, he's referred to as God, the Theos in the Greek. Uh, he's referred to as Almighty, speaking of the fact that God is all-powerful. He's called righteous. There's no injustice found in God whatsoever. He's referred to as true. He keeps his promises. Uh, God cannot lie. And he's referred to as the king of the nations. It speaks, uh, in essence, of Christ, the fact that Christ will rule the earth for a thousand years when he returns. Uh, It says here that everyone will fear God, his power, will have been manifest, everyone will glorify God, the spotlight will be on God, uh, for he alone is holy, only he, the the word for holiness in the Greek just means separated, uh, and and it speaks of God being the only one of being totally separated from sin. Even the saints are those who are uh, separated for God's purposes. Uh, but it says all the nations will worship him. They will recognize God's worth, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in Jerusalem. For his righteous acts have been re- revealed. No one will be able to question any longer his justice. Um, you know, why does God allow innocent babies to suffer? Questions like that come up. But when he returns, it's going to be amply clear. It's going to be very obvious. He had every right to do uh, whatever he has done. 
and uh, no one will be able to question him, and uh, he will reign uh, when he returns, but he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years, and then after that he'll reign over the universe throughout all eternity. Uh, now, saying everyone will fear God, everyone will glorify Him, and that type of thing, he's not necessarily saying that the only people they're talking about here are believers. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, along with Isaiah, I forget the exact chapter, speaks about the fact that when Christ returns, every knee is going to bow to Him, even those who are under the earth, even those who reject Jesus Christ as Savior, are going to be forced to bend the knee uh, recognizing that uh, that he is the sovereign Lord and too powerful for them to uh, mess with. Now, verses 5 to 8 speak about the temple in heaven. Revelation 15, verses 5 to 8. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their breast with, with golden girdles. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Uh, the word for temple here in the Greek is naos, uh, which means the... Uh, uh, no, actually, I think it's the. Uh, let's check, check out that word in the Greek. It's, it's either naos or it's hieron, and uh, it's naos. And now I can't remember if uh, it's the inner. So that's the sanctuary, the holy of holies. Whereas uh, hieron, my I, I wrote it down real vague in my notes. The Aaron would be the entire temple, and uh, so it's now it's the sanctuary, it's the Holy of Holies that's being spoken about. The Holy of Holies plus the most holy place, plus the, the holy place, the two of them, but it's the, the sanctuary portion of the temple, the holy portion of the temple. Uh, the tabernacle, the tabernacle was a portable temple which was patterned after the heavenly one according to the book of Exodus. So apparently there's supposed to be some tabernacle in heaven, some temple in heaven, which may turn out to be the New Jerusalem, which 